thanks for having me here. I wanted to uh, start off and just kind of talk about uh, something that my wife told me. We've discussed stuff uh, on and off. We've been married, uh, it's going to be our 20th uh, anniversary coming up. And she always talks about how reading about passionate people, people that have made a difference in the world from Albert Einstein to uh, astronauts or any of the above, how they seem to have all sacrificed stuff really close to them, really important things that I think sometimes uh, a lot of us miss. And this is not going to be like any Fitzgerald talk that uh, I've ever done. Let me grab the, I took off there, that's my smoothness. But um, it, most of the talks I've done about the Edmund Fitzgerald have been involving gas mixes and computer programs and uh, the type and style of diving that we did. This is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be how the Fitzgerald kind of opened my eyes and uh, changed me and uh, maybe even saved me if that uh, doesn't sound too silly. So let's talk about something. So. The title is Exploring the Deeper We, and I thought I'd be clever being an old guy with uh, not a lot of computer knowledge. If you look at the little reflection underneath there, see how it says, <laughs> see how it says me? Yeah, pretty, pretty neat how that worked, though. And uh, now, well, we talk about, uh, I, I noticed a lot of the more mature members of the audience were laughing. Uh, I'm backstage before this talk, and one of, the, one of the young ladies in the back goes, so when did you uh, dive this? I go, oh, 1995. And uh, I think that she goes, oh my God. Like, I don't, <laughs> like, you know, Lake Superior was still there then. And uh, I, know, I know, I don't think half of the people uh, back there that are putting this thing on were even born yet, which is truly depressing. <laughs> all right, there we go. We're all kind of showing you glimpses into our past. So, so here it is. I got to get another thing up front with you. We've, you've heard so many people talk about passion, passion, passion. And I got to be honest, it's almost like a passion encounter group. My passion from the youngest age, literally as long as I can remember, has been diving. Uh, for those, again, older members in the audience who remember a French guy that used to come into our living rooms on Thursday night, yeah, and he would talk about the inky darkness and how the members of the Calypso team would plunge into, you know, and all this. And I was hooked. I knew that is exactly what I wanted to do. And this guy was a nine-year-old me, and uh, that's in a spring near, in North Florida. You see, I uh, looked just as handsome then as I do now, and was just as photo photogenic. But uh, this nine-year-old guy had already been diving for a year, and uh, my uncle taught me to dive, and I just knew exactly what I was going. We've heard some of the speakers talking about life choices and, and all the, the struggles. I, that was not me. I knew exactly what I wanted to do, which was to explore things underwater and somehow get paid for it. Well, for some of you, you recognize that, and I guess the rest of you can probably read, and that it's right across the front there, and that is the, uh, uh, that's the Edmund Fitzgerald. Now, the reason I put the nine-year-old me is because a pivotal event happened in this ship's life uh, when I was nine years old. Now, of course, the Edmund Fitzgerald was uh, launched in the late 1950s. She was one of the largest. At the time she was launched, she was the largest ore carrier uh, on the Great Lakes. She was 729 feet long. And she was, uh, for those of you that have heard the Gordon Lightfoot song, the pride of the American side, as they said, and just a, a really neat piece of engineering and a great working vessel. Well, she left Superior, Wisconsin, uh, November 9th, 1975. It was supposed to be the last of her journeys for that particular year. In case some of you haven't noticed, being a Florida guy, you have a lot of white stuff on the ground. I was uh, taking pictures for my kids and everything. And of course, the lake shut down for these big freighters and. Uh, and uh, so she was on her last run for the season. Well, gales were predicted, and of course, as things happen, those gales came to pass. Well, she passed uh, one of the ports going into Lake Superior, and a ship tagged in along behind her. A ship at the time that was not quite as large as the Fitzgerald called the Arthur Anderson. Well, seasoned crew, seasoned captains on both vessels, They'd seen storms before, but this storm was a little bit different. Now, um, uh, how, many of, uh, how many of the folks out here have been here and seen some storms on the Great Lakes, on Lake Superior? Yeah, just about everybody here. 
we're, we're pretty impressed with uh, hurricanes down in Florida. And um, when I first came up here, that's kind of the impression I had, like, oh, hurricanes, those are, those are man storms, not, not Great Lakes, what's gonna happen? Until I watched uh, Lake Superior change over the course of a three hour period when we were out diving one time from mirror calm to kicking waves over the bows of one of these. And the, at the time it was a thousand foot oar freighter when uh, we were watching. So I gained a lot of respect for uh, Lake Superior and the Great Lakes in general. So the Fitzgerald, she's struggling. There's all kinds of theories of which I'm not gonna comment on because I'm not a marine engineer, but she struggled and she was taking water over her decks. And she, both of her radars had been swept away to the tune that she contacted the Arthur Anderson, the ship following her, told her she was gonna slow down and she needed her to be her effectively eyes and ears on this horrible journey. And she did, that's exactly what happened. They traversed across the width of Lake Superior and then started that southward turn down toward the Sioux Locks. And this is neat to talk to you guys because you know the Sioux Locks, people in Florida or in Japan or wherever we do these locks. Sioux Locks, what's the, <laughs> yeah. So it's nice having some local expertise here. So the one comment from the Anderson was that they thought the Fitzgerald had turned a little bit late and came a little bit close to a, a shoal. Well, time is ticking by. Now the winds on some occasions are gusting up to hurricane force, over 75 miles an hour. She's taking uh, water consistently across her decks. One of her fence rails is down. She's describing this damage to the captain of the Arthur Anderson. She's saying she has two vents gone. And so they're checking in. Well, now they turn south and a Norwegian ocean going freighter, they used to call them salties, was coming up into the lake. And the Fitzgerald hailed her saying, hey, does anybody know whether the lighthouse at Whitefish Point is working? They had the exchange. And then almost as an afterthought, the captain of that Norwegian vessel said, hey, how are your problems? And the Fitzgerald's captain said, we are holding our own. Within 15 minutes, this was the Edmund Fitzgerald. No longer 729 feet long, ripped in half. Her 29,000 tons of taconite ore spread all over the bottom of Lake Superior. And her and her entire 29-man crew gone. Pretty amazing turnaround. Well, the next day, the 11th, this was all over the news. I'm sure most of you remember this, at least that are of that age. I even heard about this down in Florida. It was a big deal. Back then, just like now, a 729-foot-long vessel and its entire crew just don't disappear. Okay, they just don't vanish without a trace. I mean, there's got to be some survivors. Well, there wasn't. This was all over the place. And so this kid with the fabulous hairdo, I, I was fascinated by this. I, I couldn't believe that things like this could happen. I mean, I was a pretty seafaring kid. I knew all about the Titanic and in wartime things, the Lusitania. My father was in the Navy in World War II. So it really fascinated me. But we all know what the news cycle is. Back then it was a little bit slower, but it was still a news cycle. And so it passed on, kind of passed out of everybody's mind till the next year, of course, when a certain figure we all know, Gordon Lightfoot, wrote a song about the Fitzgerald, which was fascinating. I remember laying there in my room listening to it as a 10-year-old. But again, me being in Clearwater, Florida, and the Edmund Fitzgerald being in Lake Superior, didn't really think that much about it. I had no idea that our lives would become intertwined forever, which I thought was pretty, uh, pretty interesting development. So in this time, I'm getting older and I'm going after firsts. Now remember what I talked to you about my, my wife's quote earlier. People that are passionate about things and want to achieve and be the absolute best they can be something's got to give. There's only so many hours in the day, and I was that guy. I was young, and diving was everything to me. I sacrificed 
education for it. I sacrificed relationships for it. I put my family on hold for it. It was all about me, me, me. Being first on something, being the best diver. I mean, I remember it's laughable now, but I remember just when someone asked me what I want to do, I said, I want to be the best diver in the world. That's a pretty lofty goal to be the best at anything. Well, it came to pass that the gentleman on the left, his name is Michael Zlatopolsky. Okay, uh, I know him and most of the people know him as Mike Z. He's a, uh, he was a food distributor out of Chicago, Illinois. He came to me in the early 1990s for some dive training. He wanted to learn how to dive deep and he had a singular purpose. He wanted to dive the Edmund Fitzgerald. Now let me tell you about this guy. He's, he's a, the true American immigrant story. He defected from the Soviet Union and had $25 in his pocket when he arrived here and ended up becoming one of the most successful businessmen in Chicago, in the Midwest. Well, he came to me and he told me how he wanted to do the fits. I was gonna help train him, show him how to use the mixed gases and all that fun stuff. And I really had no interest in it. I was busy about pursuing cave diving and deep diving and doing all of these first. I wanted to be at this place first and all that. Well, we got to where we would see each other at these dive shows and these things and we would talk to each other and I'd say, hey Mike, have you dove the fits yet? Hey Mike, have you dove the fits yet? Year after year. No, one thing or another and he was teamed up with an individual that just, ne they never could seem to pull the trigger. So finally, being Mr. Self-Centered, I said, Mike, let's just do this thing. It's gas mixes, it's decompression profiles, it's just an underwater mountain. Let's climb it, you know? I was in my 20s, I had, you know, I, I, I knew everything. So let's just, let's just do this thing and put it to rest, okay? It's just another goal. And we did. <laughs> That's the two of us after this dive. Now, we had planned a series of dives there throughout the week. And uh, it, it's funny, I was trying to brush up on the history of my own dive. Um, I was looking uh, earlier today on uh, some various you know, electronic things about the dive and all the experts out there. It's funny, there were four of us there and there's a lot of experts on that dive now. Well, I never knew that I had been arrested and thrown into Canadian jail for doing this. I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, we, it, it's funny because people say, oh, you snuck dove it, and, and no, we didn't. We got the appropriate permits, and I was standing in the office when we did. Our captain, a Canadian citizen, requested permits from the local office. He said, we'd like to dive this particular area of the wreck. And they're like, what are you going to do? They said, we're going to dive the Edmund Fitzgerald. And the guy goes, yeah, sure, here. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we got the permit to do it. So, so we did it, and, and from this angle, it was, it was an accomplishment. Okay, but... You gotta talk about this if you're gonna talk about the Fitzgerald. Now this is the port side, the left side, bridge wing on the, on the front of the Edmund Fitzgerald, the part that's upright. And I'm a real kinesthetic guy. I've gotta, for me, ha ha touching things makes it real to me. So, you know, people have talked about all kinds of things. Oh, are you down there, you know, trying to look at uh, the 29 bodies and all this. I said, no, we were, honestly, we were not down there to do things like that. We were trying not to become 30 and 31 is what we were doing. Because this technology was pretty new at the time. And so the first dive was gonna be a quick exploration. Let's get, get down there, let's look at the wreck, let's see how things are you know, uh, looking on the bottom and then we'll come up and then we'll start to do a systematic exploration of the bow over that ensuing week. Well, bef as we get down to the bottom, we had a 15 minute bottom time, which includes your time to descend. And we had some issues on the way down. We had some equipment malfunctions and various things. But at the end of it, you give what's called the up signal. Your thumb is up and up you go. So we just came up right along our hull. And then right there was that rail. It was just looking, looking me in the face. And I just took, the, took a moment to just take my hands and grip that rail. That was powerful to me. That was, that was really something because we'd done a lot, risked a lot, and suddenly we had accomplished this and we knew we were gonna come back and do other things. But it was, it was almost as I can trace the selfishness going out of me to this moment, and I'll explain why. Well, we had a long decompression. Okay, decompression is what's necessary to allow the various gases that build up in your bloodstream to come out. And so our first decompression stop uh, was at 400 feet. 
which is deeper than a lot of people had been in the world at the time. And then we did a three and a half hour decompression, switching gases and doing things, and then breathed more oxygen on the surface. And then we all ran to the Whitefish Point Museum, bought uh, paintings of the Edmund Fitzgerald, and all signed it under the Fitzgerald's bell. Because it had been recovered earlier that year in a wearable submarine called a newt suit, which was a really, really neat expedition. So having that tangible contact with the Fitzgerald was extremely important to me. And as I said, it's almost as if something changed. Now, another wreck. Anybody recognize this? This is probably older for most people. Off of New York, the Andrea Doria. Andrea Doria was another thing that Mike and I worked on. We went down there, recovered lots of china and all kinds of things on it. But we discussed at that point that maybe we would need to do something a little different. Yeah, because it wasn't enough to just go down there and do it for ourselves anymore. We had to try to start, it, it's gotta be more about risking lives and limbs and all that for a newspaper article or a, or a talk. It has to become something bigger than ourselves. So using that passion to do something. So I'm gonna close with this. I've probably talked a little too long. Everybody loves manatees. Everybody know that's a manatee, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's not a walrus without tusks. All right, well, so, in the intervening years, as you've already gathered, since I'm about to have a 20th anniversary, I met a very patient, oh, now I'm getting choked up, a very, very patient lady. And she has helped me get over myself. And we've also had two really incredible kids in the, in the interim. And the thing that I've loved so much about being a dad is you get to experience all those things that you experience first, but you can tailor them. You can, you can make them as close to perfect as you can. And so my son wanted to learn to snorkel, wanted to learn to scuba dive, and so it's a step at a time, and I never wanted to be accused of being that dad that forced him into it. So I went ahead and said, yep, we'll buy you, you know, we'll, we'll get you some snorkeling stuff, but you have to learn how to swim first. You gotta really learn how to learn, you know, do well, because his swimming wasn't quite so, wasn't quite so perfect. I said, you got to really work on it, and then we'll go. And then I had to go away for some military duty. Well, I get back two weeks later, and this kid's SEAL teaming it through our swimming pool. He's <laughs> breath holding. He's swimming the length underwater. He he's, uh, not, didn't fall far from the tree. He really wanted to, to do this. So we went out and bought him his stuff, practiced in the pool, and then I figured I'm going to structure this experience for him. Have any of you guys ever been into any Florida Springs? Is anybody in here? Oh, a few. Yeah, okay. All right, so the springs are really beautiful, beautiful places in Florida. Um, and in the winter, a lot of them fill up with these critters because the water's 72 degrees all year round. I know that's pretty cold, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, 72 degrees. I'm gonna, my, I think my children are listening. I'm going to think on them real quick. But they were complaining about 69-degree water the other day. <laughs> Daddy, it's freezing. I said, huh? <laughs> so... <laughs> We all know different, don't we? Yes, we do. Yeah, so I wanted to structure this right. And in, in the summer, when this was, the, uh, the springs really fill up on the weekend. So I figured I'd take a day off. We'd do it on a Monday. We'd get there early. Nobody'd be there, so he could just take it easy. Now, in the, in the summer, you see there's lots of little fish and stuff like that, but not much else. There's no manatees there in the summer. So we went ahead, took him in there, got our masks on. We were the only ones in the park. It was really, really nice. It was looking to be a really beautiful day. Well, he's getting ready. I pull my mask on, and I just go under. And I'm like, uh, uh, a manatee? <laughs> what's, what's a manatee? You're not supposed to be here. <laughs> okay, and, if, and, and as we all know, they're covered under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, so you can't just go harass them or go, I'm going to go pet it or anything like that. So I'm just like, oh, TJ, look at this. My son's name is TJ. I said, TJ, there's a manatee. There's a manatee. Look at this. And as he's putting his hand under the water, a littler manatee, much littler, swims around from behind the other manatee. And I'm like, oh, oh. Now, this manatee is so little that it still has a little bit of umbilical cord. Yeah, no, that, I knew that. Oh. 
you know, and it was, you know, still wobbling. It's trying to learn how to swim, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, you've got, look at this, and then now I'm going to be the, you know, the responsible adult. Well, now we're going to put our hands under here. We're not going to reach out to the animal because the animal doesn't, you know, we don't want to threaten it. It's a baby, so let's just back away, and we back, we, we're trying to back away, and mom sees us, brings her and her little baby right over to us. I'm like, uh, I'm going to get yelled at. I'm going to get in trouble. Well, Mrs. M Mommy Manatee, I'm practicing my alliteration, comes right up and takes her fuzzy little face and pushes it against my mask. And, oh, I'm getting choked up. And baby does the same thing to my son. So, as if this isn't enough, we, we're trying to let them go. They're frolicking with us. We're like, oh my gosh. And, and, and then we come up. He's starting to get cold. We're s sitting in shallow water talking. And a hawk, wham, grabs a fish right from between us and lands two feet away and starts eating it. He's like... <laughs> <laughs> and he's starting to shake. And he goes, Dad... Is it always like this? <laughs> and I said, yes, it is. <laughs> because it's always this incredible. Every time you go exploring, you're going to see something. And what the fits taught me is to take it from me and turn it into we. And that's why I got that situation, so... Thank you all very, very much.